Everybody is here, so let's start with our second session with uh, Bernhard Hanke from Universität Augsburg in Germany again. So he's kind of a coarse personality, are you? Let's go. Coarse and rough. So you take the microphone, then I take this one. Yes. Okay, so it seems that this is working. Um, it's uh, another talk about positive curvature geometry, but in some sense I'm on the other extreme. Um, we are talking about scalar curvature, which is of course a much weaker curvature notion than uh, sectional curvature. And uh, so we heard in the previous talk that there are very few examples of positively curved manifolds in the sense of sectional curvature. Um, but um, when we look at scalar curvature, the picture is different. And uh, so we have this, I would say, guiding conjecture, which is still um, uh, kind of one of the leading principles of the fields of uh, positive scalar curvature geometry and topology. And I stated it in a slightly vague way. Namely, um, I say that a closed connected manifold of dimension at least five, that is always important here, admits a positive scalar curvature metric if and only if a generalized index invariant on M vanishes. So it is imprecise in the sense that um, it includes both the spin and non-spin cases. Uh, so in the spin case, this um, index invariant is the a hat genus, or um, then more generally, this is the contribution of Rosenberg, um, an index living in some K-theory connected to a C star algebra of the fundamental group of M. And in the non-spin case, this, say, uh, quote, unquote, generalized index invariant is supposed to vanish. So um, what I want to say here is that we have one simple criterion, conjecturally, that allows us to decide if a given manifold admits a positive scalar curvature metric or not. Um, and there are different strands. Um, in the recent years, as we can say, um, especially uh, this index invariant itself, and it's not non-vanishing, has been um, uh, explored a lot uh, in very general contexts, C star algebras, coarse geometry, whatever. And this is always to decide whether a manifold does not admit a metric of positive scalar curvature. And this conjecture, of course, makes a prediction when it, uh, not only when it does not, but also when it does. And uh, so uh, in this talk, I would like to explore more that direction. Uh, so let's see some results in that direction that we have. So this is maybe the most impressive um, uh, contribution to that conjecture, namely, uh, we know that it is true in the simply connected case. So this is the famous paper of Gromov and Lawson uh, from 1980, where they um, uh, introduced their surgery technique and the connection to bordism theory, and then later on by Stefan Stolz in the spin case, uh, using connections to um, uh, more elaborate methods in topology especially the atom spectral sequence came into play here. And um, so the, the most difficult part here, or kind of the kind of non-trivial non part, is to construct these metrics of positive scalar curvature. So there must be some very general construction principles, um, contrary to the case of positive sectional curvature. And um, these construction principles actually allow us to connect the problem uh, into a um, topological setting and a topological language that can then be treated by fairly abstract and efficient methods from algebraic topology. So in that sense, um, maybe this talk is the most algebraic topological one in the sense that the geometry is really treated within the language of topological objects. I will... Um, tell you later what this means. But let us look a little more than, uh, 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 at a little more examples. So the non-spin case uh, means, <clears throat> so the prediction is that if the universal covering of M is a non-spin manifold, then M is conjectured to admit a positive scalar curvature metric, so no, con no obstruction at all. 
But here we have an interesting, uh, a very interesting uh, finding of uh, Thomas Schick, namely uh, the conjecture is actually wrong. And this, I mean, somehow people tend to put this aside a little bit and still look at this conjecture, but I mean, it is just wrong in general. And this is a not very good sign, I would say. At least uh, for infinite fundamental groups, it's definitely wrong. Um, the point is that the index obstructions in uh, the non-simply connected case uh, do not um, uh, cover the whole of... Uh, or, or all obstructions against positive scalar curvature. So there is also the minimal hypersurface obstruction, which is in some sense um, yeah, complementary to the index theoretic one, and which especially also works in the non-spin case. Okay, so and um, then we have um, a stable version, which is, I would say, for geometers, not very interesting, because this tells us that not M itself uh, um, admits a positive scalar curvature metric under some circumstances, but after multiplying it with a number of bot manifolds, B8. And I would say this is not what we are interested in. I mean, we uh, want to know whether M admits a positive scalar curvature metric or not, but the stable conjecture is really connected to um, uh, this more abstract index theory, and then we can treat that, that statement. And uh, so another point is that for finite fundamental groups, uh, we do not have counterexamples to the conjecture. Um, let us now um, really look at the non-simply connected case. And in this talk, I would like to concentrate on, on finite fundamental groups, finite fundamental groups of odd order. So in general, uh, in the odd order case, the previous conjecture can be um, written down uh, in this more simple way, this was done in a paper by uh, Jonathan Rosenberg, um, namely if we have a finite uh, uh, fundamental group of, of odd order, then the conjecture says that M admits a positive scalar curvature metric if and only if the universal cover does. And so we can phrase that also as a symmetry problem, namely, um, okay, you have a manifold M tilde, and you have a um, finite group of odd order acting freely, and then the statement is that then M tilde admits a positive scalar curvature metric if and only if it also admits one which is invariant under the action. Okay, so that is um, this statement here. And uh, one remarkable fact is that we uh, do not know this conjecture in many cases. Um, so once we look at non-simply connected manifolds, the world of positive scalar curvature manifolds is pretty much uh, yeah, non-understood, I would say. Contrary to, I think most people believe, um, we cannot say much. So um, one uh, particular case was de dealt with in this paper by, by Rosenberg. So where is the pointer? It is backside, okay. Uh, so this is the case basically of cyclic fundamental groups. And uh, more generally, by using transfer arguments, one can then pass to um, fundamental groups with the property that all P pseudo subgroups are cyclic for every prime P. Here we are restricting to odd primes, of course. So these are the fundamental groups with periodic cohomology. And then there is another remarkable and important case, namely that of um, elementary abelian P groups, or um, alternatively, groups all of whose p pseudo subgroups are elementary abelian. Um, so we need an additional assumption, p aturality, which I will consider, which I will define in a second. And uh, this uh, case was uh, treated in a paper by um, Boris Botvinnik and Jonathan Rosenberg in 2001. And actually in there, so there is a um, homological computation which had uh, a serious gap, I would say. So I... Um, then took up the, the topic and wrote a paper on that case, which was published in 2016 in the, paper, in the Journal of Topology. Um, so already that case is really non-trivial. But apart from these two cases, as far as I know, for odd order fundamental groups, finite fundamental groups, there are no cases where we really uh, know what's going on. 
uh, with respect to the Komov Lawson Rosenberg conjecture. So we do not know whether positive scalar curvature metrics exist or not. So what does P a total mean? This is an assumption which um, I have to make, or we have to make in, in this uh, theorem. And this is some, in, uh, some kind of finite analog of um, torality, which would mean that you have cohomology classes, rational cohomology classes in degree one, uh, such that the um, cup product of these classes um, evaluates non-trivially on the fundamental class of the manifold. So this is the same thing just with Z mod P or P to the K coefficients. Um, I say that an, a manifold is M is P atoral if whenever I take D classes in cohomological degree one, I take the cup product evaluated on M, then I get zero. So if that happens, if we do not get zero, then uh, I do not know if we have positive scalar curvature or not. Um, so under this assumption that this does not happen, uh, we have this existence result here. And um, so uh, just a short um, remark. Um, this is always the case if uh, the fundamental group of M has smaller rank than the dimension of M. So in high dimensions, this is not uh, a restriction. Um, so as I said before, um, this is a certain analog of um, torality. So if you take Z coefficients here instead of finite coefficients, then um, this means that you find one-dimensional um, rational classes um, there, such their cup product evaluates non-zero on M. So these are zero toral manifolds, as we might call them. And they actually do not admit metrics of positive scalar curvature. Because then we have an index obstruction in the spin case. And in the non-spin case, we have the minimal hypersurface technique. Um, we can namely take, uh, say, so we work by induction. Um, let's take uh, the final cohomology class CD. This is represented by a map from M to S1, to the one sphere. And then we can take um, uh, um, a regular pre-image, which is a hypersurface of co-dimension one. And we take a minimal, volume minimal representative in the um, same homology class. And then one can show that this also admits positive scalar curvature. So then we can go on by induction and arrive at a contradiction in low dimension two, because um, the two torus does not admit a positive scalar curvature metric. So here I am, um, of course, skipping the regularity issues that are not a problem in dimension less than eight or less than or equal than eight in high dimensions. Um, I do not want to enter this discussion now, but in principle, we have this uh, the statement here that um, uh, zero toral manifolds actually do not admit positive scalar curvature metrics. So this is just a remark which is not directly connected to the uh, theme of my, my talk. Um, but, but what is maybe interesting is that we can, of course, construct p-toral manifolds very easily by just taking a torus, d-torus, which has fundamental group z, mod d, uh, uh, z to the d, and then we can uh, kill um, p times uh, the generators in the fundamental group by surgery. So in this case, uh, we get um, a P toral manifolds, and this is actually an open problem for your session. Um, do these manifolds admit positive scalar curvature or not? And uh, actually, there is also a point which I find uh, fascinating, and maybe I should talk to, to some of the experts here in the room. Um, is there any chance to, to mimic that proof, a minimal hypersurface proof, in the case of uh, finite coefficients? So, in fact, um, if you have a p-toral manifold for um, uh, non-zero p, then uh, we don't, do not get these hypersurfaces anymore as smooth manifolds or anything, but uh, we have to pass to more general objects, namely um, we have to use manifolds, say, with Z mod P coefficients. So slightly more general, and then maybe it is possible to, to mimic that proof, uh, the minimal hypersurface proof in that uh, under these circumstances, but I do not know at all if that is possible or not. 
So um, here's an interesting open problem. But I would like to um, show you a path how we can prove the existence of positive scalar curvature metrics um, if the fundamental group of M is abelian, that's important, and of odd order. Um, and of course, are toral for all odd P. So again, I'm restricting to odd order fundamental groups. I take the, the, the abelian case. And now if you look at one prime at a time, this basically amounts to passing from elementary abelian P groups to more general abelian P groups, which are of the form Z mod P to the K1 cross dot 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 Z modulo P to the KR. So this is the generalization I would like to present here and what methods we use to construct these metrics of positive scalar curvature using topological methods. So this is the main theorem. And um, let me recall one important construction principle that has been very uh, influential and very efficient and which is also basic for the existence results of Gromov, Lawson and Stolz. Namely, this is uh, the connection to Bordesen theory. Uh, so for an arbitrary topological space, X, uh, let me recall what I mean by that thing. So this is a group, and the elements in that group are um, given by maps from um, some n-manifold, a smooth, closed n-manifold, uh, a d-manifold n to X. So this is, um, so these are maps to X, and we divide out the borders and relation. So this is the the simple picture, we have a manifold N1, we have a map to X, another manifold N2, a map to X, and these are identified in that group if we find a manifold co-bounding uh, these two, uh, the disjoint union of N1 and N2. And of course there are many flavors of borders and theory, oriented spin and many others. Uh, not lot, that's not put so much effort to, uh, in this distinction, but uh, this, this uh, definition is, is really important here. So what does it have to do with positive scalar curvature? The point is that we can define a certain subgroup, which I call the positive Bordism group, and this just means that I restrict to representatives um, to classes which can be represented by maps from a positive scalar curvature manifold into X. Okay, so this is a certain subgroup. It's an abstract definition. We can write it down and then hope that something uh, useful comes out of it. So, and, but um, you should really uh, remark here, or um, it's important to see that we um, combine this topological definition directly with a geometric condition. So we put um, the uh, geometric condition, uh, scal a scalar curvature assumption directly onto the representatives of this homology theory or this Bordesen theory. This is a very important principle here. Okay, so we have positive Bordesen. And I call this a construction machine for positive scalar curvature metrics because we have uh, the Bordesen principle for constructing positive scalar curvature metrics. And the point is here um, we have to restrict to dimension at least five. Um, we look at the classifying map of the universal cover of M. So B pi one of M is the classifying space for the fundamental group. It's a topological space whose only homotopy groups are in degree one and it's equal to pi one of M. So we can uh, actually think of that space as being constructed from M by um, adding cells, killing all homotopy groups from degree two onwards. Okay, so we take this special map, and this uh, thing here, of course, represents an element in the bordism of this uh, space. And then we actually have the two following statements which are equivalent. M itself admits a positive scalar curvature metric, and the other is that this class represented by this particular map lies in the positive part of the Bordism of B pi one of M. So the picture is here that we have, uh, it's the same one as before, but uh, we have to find a picture like this where we have a positive scalar curvature metric on the left hand 
um, map, and on the right-hand side we take uh, the classifying map, and we have to be able to fill that thing. This means that um, we are actually in the positive part. And just to complete the statement is, uh, I have to um, remark that in the spin case we work with um, spin boredism, if N, M is a spin manifold, if the universal cover of M is not spin, we take um, oriented boredism. So I do not want to say too much about the proof of this statement because I think it has been explained in many, many talks, many places in the literature. Uh, the basic principle is that we have a surgery invariance statement. So if you have a manifold, you apply surgery to it to get another manifold. Of code, I mentioned at least three then you, um, we can conclude that this new manifold also has positive scalar curvature. And actually, there, are, um, there is a more general principle than that. We can apply this to, to more general curvature properties, as was point, pointed out in a um, uh, PhD thesis of, of Stefan Hölzel, a previous uh, former student of, of Burkhard Wilking. But um, here in, in the positive scalar curvature geometry, I think this is the prototypical example. And once you have such a statement, a surgery invariance statement, then we have the connection to differential topology via Morse theory and the H. Cobordison theorem, and then we are in business. And this is why such a statement has a chance to be true. Okay, so um, what can we do with it? Um, I would like to go back to the computation uh, in the case of elementary abelian P groups. I, uh, I told you that in this case, we, for our toral manifolds, we have a statement, we have an existence statement, and this amounts to computing the borders and groups of uh, the corresponding space B pi 1 of M, right? So uh, this means we have to compute the uh, borders and group of um, classifying spaces of elementary abelian P groups. And this computation is exactly the one that was not uh, finished correctly in the paper by Winnie Rosenberg, and I um, wrote it down in my paper. The statement is the following. Um, we find very special representatives, namely, uh, so look at these lens spaces, L2M plus 1 in each odd dimension. We just divide out the free Z mod P action on an odd dimensional sphere. We can take a standard action, so a standard lens space. And then we have uh, canonical maps. You can take just a, a product of such lens spaces and map it to a product of classifying spaces for the group Z mod P. Each of these lens spaces has such a map to be Z mod P. You just take the product of these maps. And this is not enough to generate the bordism. We pass from uh, the classifying space of Zp mod k to the one of Z mod p to the r, um, which is uh, the group that is appearing here, just by applying some group homomorphism. In some sense, you could think of that as a twisted product of lens spaces, or I call it a generalized product of lens spaces. And by the way, uh, such a statement also makes, um, uh, has a non-trivial conclusion in the uh, topology of group actions. So this is uh, kind of going back to the classical work of Connor and Floyd in the 60s, um, where um, actually these groups were calculated to some extent, but this result here was not um, stated uh, at this uh, time. So uh, here we need a new argument. And now let's see which, what classes here are positive, right? So which ones can be represented by positive, um, by uh, positive scalar curvature manifolds? And we see that this is the case once at least one of these lens spaces has dimension larger than one. Because then um, you divide out a free Z mod P action on a three sphere or five sphere, you have positive scalar curvature, no problem. The only point is that is left is you take a product of one-dimensional lens spaces, which are S1s. So you have a torus here mapping to B, Z mod P to the R, and then we cannot say if the corresponding class here is positive or not. So um, that's the point why we have to exclude these classes. But this is actually more or less the end of the story, because uh, for more general groups, 
this, the computation of these Bordism groups is extremely complicated, or I would even say impossible. So um, this is the, I think, uh, so for elementary abelian P groups, we have some result like this, but for more general abelian P groups, I do not have anything like that. And without such a computation, there is no chance to apply the Bordism principle. Uh, to positive scalar curvature geometry because, um, I mean, if we do not know this group, then uh, let alone we cannot prove anything which classes are positive or not. Okay, so this is really a barrier. And so this is why I would like to um, uh, simplify the setting in such a way that we can really apply homological computations. So not borders and theoretic computations, but I would prefer to use homology of these, of these classifying spaces because then we, are, we have more methods of computation. And uh, for sure we can compute the homology, usual homology of classifying spaces of groups much more easily than borders and theory. And, but this means the following, and this is the, a key point of my talk. Um, so a Bordism theory, we have maps from manifolds to spaces, and so we immediately know what it means that this manifold has positive scalar curvature. If we use homology, then we have more general sorts of representatives, no longer manifolds, but for example, you can take singular cycles or simplices, and then you have to um, uh, um, describe what it means that these objects have positive scalar curvature. Okay, so um, there is one uh, very convenient setting to carry out such an argument, and this is within the uh, world of manifolds with bass sullivan singularities. And the point is that these are sufficient for describing homology um, at least at odd primes. So this is uh, the path that I would like to enter now. And we are talking about positive scalar curvature on manifolds with bass sullivan singularities. So what is it? We, um, we fix some singularity types, as we call it. So this is just a sequence of, of closed smooth manifolds. And um, so the intuitive way of thinking is that these manifolds, or rather cones over these manifolds, are allowed, are allowed objects within that category. So we allow certain singularities, which you might think of cones, over these special singularity types. And um, so then we are no longer in the smooth world, but we have certain types of singularities, but well-controlled ones. Uh, the point is here that we have to iterate the process to some extent, and this um, adds a certain kind of combinatorial bookkeeping to the whole picture, and I try to describe it as easily as I can on this, on this slide. I will um, uh, give you um, a simple picture on the next slide. So actually, we need a whole bunch of, um, uh, of manifolds with corners. So manifolds with corners are always modeled on, um, locally modeled on, on corner models like this, uh, 0, 1 um, to the k, so we have a corner point of co-dimension k, um, uh, uh, dimension k cross u, and u is an open subset of some uh, space um, n minus k, right? So this is then an n-dimensional manifold with, with corners, maybe we take d minus k, local models like this, and um, so we have certain decompositions of, uh, of, of boundaries, namely the, the boundary decomposes into, uh, into co-dimension one phases, where on each co-dimension one phase, we have an identification with a PI, with such um, singularity type, times uh, a, new, a new manifold within that list. So this I means uh, that we just take omega union I, right? So this is an iterative process. We have a manifold um, A, empty set, with boundary of that kind. Each boundary type um, has um, this product representation, and then we have smaller pieces that, again, have these decompositions. 
And then we have certain uh, compatibility conditions for these different ways we can take boundaries. Um, and maybe the easiest thing is to look at this uh, picture here. So uh, this is a manifold with um, a simple corner. And uh, so here we have the interior part, which I call a um, empty set. And then we have the ith boundary part, which is the um, uh, co-dimension one phase of this thing here. And I have to identify this with another manifold AI cross PI. AI is, you might think of this as this line here, and then we cross it with a closed manifold PI. Here we have the same thing with PJ. And in the intersection of these, we have then a new representation, AIJ cross PI cross PJ. And this goes on and on into a small, uh, bigger and bigger co-dimension. This is the picture of manifolds with bars Sullivan singularities. So we have a very well-controlled uh, singularity types. And uh, now I would like to introduce a notion of positive scalar curvature of, uh, on those things. So um, for this, I assume that these singularity types are equipped with positive scalar curvature metrics. We can do that later on without any harm. So there is no loss of generality for what I have in mind. Let's assume that. We have positive scalar curvature metrics HI. And now I would like to say what it means that we have um, positive scale, uh, that, that, that I have a distinguished metric on such a p-manifold A. So by a distinguished metric, I mean I have a, um, a general notion of Riemannian metrics, but along the singularity parts, which is this and this black line, I want a well-controlled behavior of these metrics, taking into account that on PI and PJ, I already have positive scalar curvature metrics. Um, so this is then formally given by a family of metrics on these um, manifolds A omega, like a empty set, for example, or a I and a J. And now the point is that when I restrict this metric to the boundary, then it has to be a product metric, namely the product of HI here, and um, then uh, I have the metric G omega I on these, uh, on the given metric on this piece here, and the same thing here. This is a, um, a reasonable compatibility condition. And the second condition is that um, these products that appear here for i bigger than 1 always have positive scalar curvature. So this is the dominating part of the metric on these hi's. So this is what I call distinguished metrics. And by this, I mean that at the singularity part, I have a very well-controlled positive scalar curvature uh, property. In the interior, I do not claim anything. And uh, so for, with this definition, actually, which what took me some time to write down, so it was a little, uh, was not so easy to find that. Um, here we have a very fundamental fact that you know from usual manifolds, closed manifolds or uh, manifolds with boundary, namely the space of distinguished metrics on such a p-manifold is non-empty and contractible. You can work with these metrics such uh, in the same way as with usual Riemannian metrics. The only thing is that um, at the singularity part, uh, we have these additional conditions involving the metrics HI. And uh, now I have a slightly confusing uh, picture how that, um, how that is done. Um, but in principle, it is this um, a process here, and I can stress one, one important property of positive scalar curvature geometry which comes in here. Namely, um, so what is easy is to construct these metrics G omega on these, uh, on these parts A omega, for example, GI, GIJ, GIJ, and so on, such that we have all these compatibility conditions. But... Uh, the problem is that then the condition that um, uh, uh, on the boundary, um, uh, like here, we have um, the metric HI appearing with positive scalar curvature and dominating the whole thing. This additional property, this needs additional work. And what I can do, I can start with a metric on my manifold like this. I take a very large lambda to make the scalar curvature small 
at this piece. And then I use the v collar regions to connect these with the standard metrics on these HI pieces. And this means that along this boundary here, along the singularity, uh, we always have positive scalar curvature metrics because we always see one metric HI without any lambda, right? And this, that this is possible uses two basic facts in positive scalar curvature geometry. The first is that if you take um, uh, uh, the product of two manifolds, then the scalar curvature is the sum of the scalar curvature. So if you have um, HI um, and here you take a very large lambda, then this thing has positive scalar curvature, this thing has positive scalar curvature, and so on. And the next thing is that if we move from here to here and from here to here, so we have an isotopy of positive scalar curvature metrics, then we can um, construct a concordance of positive scalar curvature metrics by just making this collar wide enough. So we, we move along these, these collar coordinates very slowly. So this is uh, a rough picture how we prove this fact. And this, is, this shows that the notion of distinguished metrics in the sense is probably the correct one on manifolds with bus sullivan singularities. And now we have an important connection to homology. Um, namely, uh, we can in fact take these singularity types, P1, P2, and so on, in such a way that they um, generate the oriented bordism modulo torsion. So this is, um, these are classic computations of Milner and Novikov, um, and a polynomial ring in generators of degree 4i, and we can take these manifolds as generators. And this is actually the, uh, one of the uh, most important theorems of the theory here um, uh, proven by Bass in his um, paper that um, these manifolds actually give a full description of the homology of, of uh, um, a classifying space of a group gamma, B gamma, if that group is of odd order. I could have stated this theorem slightly differently, namely that bordism with manifolds with bar sullivan singularities away from the prime two is, um, uh, is isomorphic to homology theory. But I think this is a more concise way to state it, and uh, now we have a very nice thing. On the right-hand side, we have a, a group which can be computed efficiently with um, kind of elementary algebraic topological methods. On the left-hand side, we have an object, bordism of um, uh, um, geometric objects that possibly um, kind of uh, allow a discussion of positive scalar curvature geometry. So this is a very... Um, important statement here in this context. So, um, okay, so to, to phrase it again, homological cycles are modeled by, oriented by, by these p-manifolds. Okay, so um, once we have that, we can uh, write down another construction machine, namely positive homology. Uh, what is that? Okay, so we just copy uh, the definition we had before. But we have to remark that in this um, choice that I made, PI as generators of the borders and ring, we can actually take these generators also with positive scalar curvature metrics. Actually, this is the main um, observation in the paper of Lawson, uh, Komov and Lawson, when they proved existence of positive scalar curvature on non-spin manifolds. Okay, so this means we have a notion of uh, distinguished metrics and also of distinguished metrics of positive scalar curvature. So remember, distinguished metrics means along the singularity part, we have a certain uh, restriction, and positive scalar curvature means positive scalar curvature everywhere. Okay, so then we just take the subgroup here, represented by borders and classes. Now we take p-manifolds, and uh, the uh, condition is that these admit distinguished metrics of positive scalar curvature. So this is now our definition of positive homology. And the point is here that, um, so this also involves classes that cannot be represented by smooth manifolds. So it's a um, more flexible notion of uh, positiveness, namely directly connected to homology theory of these odd order group gamma. 
And here we also have a Bordism uh, principle, which now becomes a homology principle. Um, a version of that was uh, proven in um, the, uh, uh, doctoral thesis of Sven Führing a couple of years ago uh, in a slightly different context, but I put it here because um, uh, important ideas appeared there, and then I, I um, uh, uh, kind of um, yeah, proved it uh, in this context again. So the, uh, the, the point is here that um, if you have, so the idea is the following, you have a manifold with Bar-Sullivan singularities, you have these manifolds, we have these corner regions, but along these, these, um, the boundary, you have a um, positive scalar curvature. This is this distinguished property. And this means that you can basically pass to a smoothening of this manifold with corners uh, and still have positive scalar curvature, so then you can connect the whole picture to the smooth world, which is already understood. So this is the reason why it's good to work with distinguished metrics of positive scalar curvature, such that we have good control along the singularity region. Okay, so um, we can now see when such a smooth manifold admits a positive scalar curvature metric, it, um, the classifying map must map the fundamental class to the positive part. So um, this means we have to compute the positive homology. Um, for example, of this group, uh, this is um, a abelian P group of rank R. It's not elementary abelian because K1, K2, and so on can be bigger than one. And uh, for these groups, we do not have a bordism calculation. But we do have a homology calculation, and this is done inductively. Uh, so uh, if we just have one factor, then the homology of the classifying space, maybe you've seen that in some lecture course or seminar, is the following. In degree D, we have in odd degrees uh, a copy of Z mod P to the K, and in even degrees we have zero. That's the computation of this homology of the classifying space of uh, Z mod P to the K. And it's also important to see that uh, we have geometric generators of these um, groups here, namely lens spaces that we saw before, right? So these lens spaces represent these homology classes. And um, so we know that in dimension bigger than one, we have positive lens, positive scalar curvature metrics. So the positive part of that homology group is nothing but the homology in degree bigger than one. This is easy. How do we pass to higher um, uh, uh, higher ranks, yeah, we write down the Kunit exact sequence. Um, that is uh, the way, the tool of our choice in order to calculate the homology of B gamma prime, which is a product of these two groups. On the left, we have a tensor product of the homologies. On the right-hand side, we have a torsion product. And in the middle, we have our homology. So, um, you derive these sequences in algebraic topology courses, and it is already one of the non-trivial tools because it is a little difficult to understand what this thing here really means. The left-hand side is easy um, because this map is just represented by taking Cartesian products of p-manifolds. So remember, elements here and here are represented by, by these p-manifolds together with maps to these spaces and then we just take Cartesian products. This is easy. Uh, but the, uh, the pre-image of beta, so if we want to understand which elements map to these elements here, so these, are, uh, these involve a total bracket construction. And uh, I think this, is, this appears in other parts of geometry and topology again and again, so let me quickly recall what this means. So this is, um, the point is, that if you have elements in these groups of the same order, P to the K, then there are two different reasons why the product of these elements is zero homologous. Namely, um, so we take these two groups, gamma I, you take two classes, and both of order P to the K, uh, because we are basically working in bordism theory, we can take the um, disjoint union 
of uh, these manifolds AI, P to the K fold disjoint union, and these bound. So these are zero bordant, and so we um, find bounding maps, Fi, and then we can write down the Toda bracket. This is what I said. There are two reasons why um, uh, uh, this, the, the product is a boundary. Namely, we can pass to W1 cross A2. This is the first way to look at it. And the second way is taking A1 cross W2. W1, W2 are the co-bounding manifolds. And uh, so now observe that the boundary of both these pieces is equal to P to the K times A1 times A2. So uh, these two can be glued together. And we get an interesting map here. So we have a certain indeterminacy lying in this subgroup. But one property is important, namely if these two classes are positive, positive scalar curvature, then um, also this total bracket is positive. Why is that? OK, so this means, um, by definition, A2 and A1 carry positive scalar curvature metrics in the sense of distinguished metrics. And then we can do the same trick. We, um, uh, we multiply them with, in this case, with a small constant to make the scalar curvature very big so that it dominates the scalar curvature of W1. Uh, so, I mean, W1 is a manifold that we don't know. So we don't know if there is positive scalar curvature or not. But we know that this uh, whole product, this, the, this total bracket, carries a positive scalar curvature metric if both these classes are positive. OK, um, just uh, to uh, make um, a, a short remark here, because this was asked um, at another occasion when I gave this talk. People who know um, bar sullivan singularities, manifolds with them, know that there is um, uh, an annoying fact or a difficult point in the theory, and this concerns products of manifolds with bar sullivan singularities. And let me point out this technical issue, which is quite important. The point is, if you have two manifolds with bar sullivan singularities, A and B, we look at the i-th boundary component. This is AI cross PI, BI cross PI. And now we would like to define the i-th boundary component of A cross B, uh, which is, uh, of course, the, uh, uh, the, the union of these two parts. And now let's look at the intersection of these two, where these two are glued. We see um, the product of the two boundary parts, and this is AI cross BI cross PI cross PI, two copies of PI. And the problem is, if we want to um, write that thing here as a manifold cross PI, one manifold cross PI, then we do not know what PI is the correct one. Because both these, they switch their roles. Uh, so the first one comes from this part, and the second one comes from this part. And then it's unclear which one is really the singularity PI. So then, therefore, one has to apply another construction which takes care of that issue. One has to glue in a new handle that allows one to switch these two factors. And I've drawn this picture because in the literature, uh, this point is usually explained, at least to my taste, in a very confusing way. It goes on for pages and pages. And then it says, OK, there are some obstructions at the prime two. And away from the prime two, there is no problem. But of course, in, the, our, in our world, when we do geometry, we need concrete uh, 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 pictures and, uh, con uh, and concrete realization. And this is given by this picture. So on the left, um, this piece here, the black piece, is one copy of A cross B. And this is the boundary part. Here, um, the two roles of PI cross PI have to switch here again. and. Um, after passing to two times the, uh, this product, we can actually solve the problem by, by, by gluing in a handle where we can, uh, which can be used to switch the two factors PI cross PI. And in our positive scalar curvature world, this is not a problem because um, this uh, thing here, I mean, it's a hexagonal piece. And if we want uh, to look at metrics which are of product form near the boundary, there are no ones with positive scalar curvature. It, it would uh, contradict the Gauss-Bonnet theorem. 
but we can again make uh, by a scaling argument this um, negative uh, scalar curvature contribution uh, small compared to the contribution that comes from these uh, PI pieces. So this um, admissible product issue, this can be resolved. It's quite important because otherwise we cannot pass to products of manifolds and discuss positive scalar curvature in the world of bass sullivan manifolds. Okay, so now with this knowledge, we can look at the induction step. And as we said, um, here we take products of P-manifolds and if one of the factors is positive, then the product is positive. This is what we like. And uh, so here we can then easily imply induction. But here we have a problem, namely um, here we just have positive scalar curvature if both factors are positive. And this is not the case if one factor has degree one, right? And these total brackets have to uh, so they appear, actually, even uh, for non-toral manifolds. So here we have a problem. So this is how far we get at this point. Um, so we, cannot, we can show um, positivity for most classes, so to speak, but there is one particular problem, namely total brackets with one-dimensional classes. And this actually... Um, took me quite a while to resolve that issue because the only way I see to do that is that we um, must find a way to restrict uh, to a certain subgroup of this group. So um, I have to deal or I want to deal with just specific atoral classes in this group. I cannot deal with all classes. I have to exclude some and I have to um, find a way to discuss a certain subgroup here which I can de uh, treat with that method. And this is actually possible um, uh, using uh, homological techniques and techniques from stable homotopy theory. Namely, I introduce uh, a new homology theory. It's derived from Brown-Peterson theory. Uh, so recall that's um, homology theory, a generalized homology theory like K theory or Bordism for each prime P with these coefficients, it's a polynomial ring. And um, uh, the point is that uh, the uh, unitary Bordism spectrum splits as a sum of suspensions of these Brown Peterson spectra. So these are actually a, a way of thinking of it is uh, that it's, uh, they are a sort of skeleton of Bordism theory. Uh, so um, what I do, I, I simplify the theory so that it get, uh, gets approachable by passing to a linearized version. I divide out the square of the uh, ideal gener uh, generated by these generators V1, V2. And the point is that this new theory sits between the um, Bordesen theory that we cannot compute, it's too difficult, and, it's, uh, and the homology theory which we can compute but that we cannot explore completely in terms of positive scalar curvature geometry because we have the problem with the one-dimensional Toda brackets. And this theory, which is pretty close to that one, this can be analyzed to such an extent that I can prove that for an abelian P group, um, gamma, and P odd, I can actually show that all atoral classes here that lie in the image of that map Right? So this is, of course, a certain restriction. So these can be treated by an in inductive argument, as I, I, I've shown before. And um, I mean, these uh, uh, Toda brackets with one-dimensional classes still appear, but then they can be discussed in a different way because we always have the freedom to apply, to apply group homomorphisms to our group gamma prime and try to cover these classes in a different way um, but um, for this, I need to, to pass to this new homology theory. And the computation here that, that, that goes in, into that theorem here is, um, is rather difficult. So one, uh, I have to prove a corner Floyd conjecture for this intermediate theory and then to uh, really do uh, concrete calculations uh, with the atia hirzebruck spectral sequence for that theory to make sure that all classes that lie in this image can ac actually be treated by this uh, inductive argument that I presented you before. Okay, so um, in this way we can deal with the uh, elementary 
you know, in, uh, with the abelian P groups. Unfortunately, I'm not able to say anything about spin manifolds in this context. It's just um, um, uh, about oriented manifolds, which are not spin. And for the spin case, I would have to deal with KO homology, and I have to find a correct analog of this theory here. And so far, I haven't been able to do that. So this is still uh, work to do, but at least for the non-spin case, we have um, a fairly complete answer for um, abelian fundamental groups of odd order. And hopefully, this sort of more more general notion of positive scalar curvature metrics uh, can also help us to deal with other fundamental groups, but I do not have any concrete results in that direction so far. So uh, thank you for your patience. Other questions? Go ahead. Yeah. But what excludes that because every oriental, I mean, every spin manifold is oriented. Yeah, that is true. But um, so if I write down the homology principle for spin manifolds, actually, I glossed it, that over um, uh, here. Let's uh, positive homology. So if you have spin manifolds, then you have to work with positive K homology. You are not, lo you are not allowed to, to, to compute these groups anymore. You have to deal with these more complicated groups, and unfortunately, they are um, really considerably more complicated to calculate than usual homology. Yeah. More questions? Sorry. Imagine that you would be allowed to change the positive scalar problem into a slightly there is a slightly different problem, okay. Riemannian geometric problem, that would fit better with your techniques. So, okay. okay, do you have a problem in mind? No, or? no, no, but... Of course, uh, yeah, that is, of course, so uh, you, a very... Should... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, um, I mean, what is the game like? We have different tools or toolboxes, right? I have the geometric toolbox, I have the homological toolbox, topological toolbox. And what I did here is to refine, I try to refine the, the geometric toolbox in a way such that my computations in, on the topological side give better answers, right? And of course, it's not clear to me, um, so where is the ideal balance? And as you say, we can, maybe that is not the correct problem to look at, because especially with this uh, one-dimensional classes. Um, uh, this is something that uh, appears in positive scalar curvature geometry. But if we would look, uh, if we looked at non-negative scalar curvature, right, then this problem does not appear. We can deal with this case right away. I did not mention that because this theorem was already mentioned in uh, the paper by Botvinnik and Rosenberg, or by different methods. So they prove that uh, if you have a manifold with abelian fundamental group of odd order, it has non-negative scalar curvature metric. So, uh, and this is very close ways. from yeah. the positive scalar curvature problem, right? A manifold that admits non-negative scalar curvature, but not strictly positive scalar curvature. Like the need Tori, a, for example. Yes, they, then they admit Ricci flat matrix, right? There is a... Yes, of course, you can go on with the discussion in this direction. Yes. And um, uh, I admit there is still room to play around and to find the correct setting so that, all th that these things, these methods, maybe fit together more nicely than in the positive scalar curvature um, context. There are more questions. Uh, if not, let's thank uh, Bernard again. Thank you.